I'm a visual artist and I was born in Santiago de Cuba. This painting is called Carnaval en la Trocha and it's about the Carnaval known as the Caravali, which used to come through the street La Trocha, which is where my grandfather lived. And this is my great-grandmother, Miss Lou. She was Jamaican and my whole family used to tell me that I was always Miss Lou reincarnated. She died when I was 23. They said I acted like her, I looked like her which used to startle me because the Miss Lou that I knew had bags under her eyes, no teeth, big at white afro, but she was beautiful. So um, I actually took that picture from a fi some film footage of her dancing like that. She, same dress, same hat, and she was a character. This portrait is called Mango Mama, and it is my grandmother who is the daughter of Miss Lou. This is my mother's mother. She was born in Jamaica and she was half black, half Chinese. My family said I looked just like her. We were very close. She died not too long ago. And when I was born, I had very Chinese eyes, and which I carried through my childhood. And so my family and all my relatives call me Latina. They call me Latina more than they call me Lily. And in Cuba, um, the Jamaican community is very close knit. And both of my grandmothers being Jamaican meant that, you know, we had a very big Jamaican influence in our family. It's for me with the robe that covered our Lord, covered my body so that I will never be attacked by these enemies with the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This portrait is called El Mambi en la Manigua, and it is my father's father, Jose Rodriguez Figueroa. He called himself Rodriguez. He was a Mambi and the Mambises were the insurgent soldiers who fought against the Spaniards in Cuba's war of uh, independence from Spain. And since he was a war correspondent, he wrote for El Cubano Libre newspaper. His weapon was actually a pen and not a sword. And his writings are archived in the National Libraries of Cuba still. And I took this excerpt from a, a real writing that he, that he wrote about the passing of his mother. And his spirit, although I never met him because he was born almost two decades before slavery ended in Cuba. He was a free black man. His spirit uh, visits me in my dreams and uh, informs my paintings. He, I feel that he puts images um, in my mind and, and poetry in my mind while I'm sleeping. And he was an activist. He was an evangelical priest, preacher, very charismatic. And I know that I got my activist spirit from him. Would the Spaniards have surrendered if so many weren't murdered? Would the pact of peace be signed beneath the saber tree? When my family left Cuba, I was about a year and a half old, and then we went straight to Spain. And I was three when we arrived in the United States. We left Cuba because my parents didn't agree with the politics. We were not allowed to leave the country with anything but the clothes on our backs. No birth certificates, no marriage certificates, no jewelry, no pictures, nothing. And so my parents um, made books like this with every page cut, and they put all their momentums in there. And my father, because he was a, an engineer at an, at, a, at an oil refinery, took these books on four occasions and gave it to these captains from the oil rigs that were coming from Venezuela and uh, the captains kindly followed my father's directions. And once they arrived at their destination, like Port Verde in Africa, they um, mailed the books to my aunt, and uh, that's how we received our things. So my father could have gotten in trouble for doing that. So when we arrived in Spain with nothing but the clothes on our backs, naturally we were very poor, and our parents couldn't afford to keep us in a, an apartment with heating. So someone gave us these hot water bottles to keep us warm at night. My mom would fill it with boiling water and we would cuddle up in our bed at night with our hot water bottles. I still have mine. It doesn't hold water very well anymore, but I do have a picture of me when it was in good shape. That's what I looked like when we left Cuba and when I was in Spain. And 
we had to eat in the soup kitchen. So when my mom talks about that story, she gets very emotional and cries. My mom had to stay in line with all the other poor people at the church to receive our food. So, you know, my parents, they suffered. As I can imagine how hard it is to leave a country when you don't want to leave your country and to leave your whole family, you know, your parents. So my parents, um, you know, they did that all that. They left the country and all their family so that we could have a better life. And uh, I can't thank them enough. I didn't really understand until I went back to Cuba in 2002 to see how my family is struggling so much just to have the basic necessities in life that we have, you know, the clean water, the food that doesn't have rocks in it, you know, the rice. And, and all I could think was, thank you, Mom and, and Papi, for, for giving us a better life and how hard it must have been. And so when we moved to the United States, we didn't really completely understand the sacrifices my parents made. They bought this great big property, I mean, a huge house with almost two acres in Princeton Junction, New Jersey, which is white collar, rich community. But to make that sacrifice, we had, whenever we had to eat a banana, it was half a banana. Um, and uh, we had plain pocket pants, you know, and old cars. And uh, we didn't understand that my father was also putting a tremendous uh, percentage of his income in the bank so that when we graduated from high school, we could all go to outstanding universities, expensive universities. And that when we got married, they gave us mon enough money, all six of us, that we could buy a house. You know, when I think that my parents did that for us, having left their country with nothing but the clothes on their backs, I'm like, this just makes me a little emotional. I owe my career to my parents. When we were in Brooklyn, and I was three and a half, my mom sat me at a table, a little triangular table, in our living room of our brownstone in Brooklyn, and she taught me how to draw a bird using just two shapes, a circle and a triangle. So with multiple circles and triangles, she showed me how to manipulate them in space to make this beautiful bird. I was like, wow, mommy, you're so brilliant. How did you do that? She's like, you can do it too. This is art. And that was like the moment I knew I was gonna be an artist. And I told my mom, I'm gonna be an artist, that's it. And she said, ever since then, she would tell me, reinforced to me constantly in writing and letters, I know you're gonna be a famous artist one day. So this is Carlota leading the people. It's after Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People. It's the second in a series of paintings that I call antebellum appropriations, meaning that they tell stories of the slaves before the war, before they were liberated. And when I looked at this painting, it just shouted out to me that this is the story of Carlota. Obviously, Liberty would be Carlota wearing yellow for Ochun. This little boy here was clearly Elegua with his red and black cap. This person over here I turned into Fermina, which was one of her comrades. This person carrying the sword here was the Orisha Oya Yansa. And I feel that these paintings will eventually be deemed as important because um, they will fill a void in the halls of art and history uh, because there's a total you know, omission of the black figure on canvas during this time when all these beautiful classical European paintings were made with all these lovely white people looking friendly and wonderful when in the background there was this atrocity that they were committing called slavery. And so this is a commemoration of the, uh, of the atrocity which my ancestors survived and endured. Um, and I figure if Eugene Delacroix made a painting about liberty le leading a revolution in France. Why can't I make a painting of Carlota, the slave leading a revolution in Cuba? So this is rich with Afro-Cuban folklore and real history. And of course, I put some fiction in it because I have the Orishas playing some of the characters. Arriving at 
Contrast 1225, on lap. Acting is something I've always done simultaneously with my visual arts. I used to act ever since I was a little girl. I would write my own plays and then force my siblings and uh, the childhood neighbors to perform in them. We'd put theaters, we'd make theaters in the backyard and invite the neighborhood to come watch us. And I always, of course, decorated the set and made beautiful little uh, drawings and stuff on the curtains. And when I was in Japan as a teenager, because my father's job as an electrical engineer with mobile oil brought us to Tokyo, I um, performed on Japanese television uh, as an actress, actually, in a, in a main um, a series, a primetime television series called Onna no Kaikyo, which means Women of the Straits of Gibraltar. I played a flamenco dancer. <laughs> and, uh, and then upon graduating from high school, I went to college, to Cornell University, principally to study visual arts, but I also um, took a lot of courses in theater. And then in New York City, I studied theater some more with Sonia Moore, who was a student of Stanislavski's. I uh, did a lot of theater in New York, did some television and film. I had a guest starring role as a very pregnant lady named Mrs. Minifield on The Cosby Show. What did I just say? Call you every eight minutes. <laughs> Waiting. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess I'm off. Yes, uh, more ways than one. <laughs> How's a tummy, Mary? Oh, I have about four months. No! No! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I played Kramer's black girlfriend on Seinfeld. had a stint on a CBS miniseries by Stephen King called Stephen King's Golden Years. And then when the baby started coming, it was hard to just get up from nursing to go to an audition. So that's when I started concentrating more on my visual arts practice. So for there's a period of about five or six years where I was just being mommy, 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 because I gave birth to six children in a 10, years, 10 year span. And uh, it wasn't until about 2006 that I really began uh, really diligently pursuing my visual arts career. I still audition for uh, commercials and, and have done some commercial work recently. And I think when my children are older, I'll probably go back to doing some TV and film work as well. My commercial agent that I've had since 1993, um, as soon as my children were born, she's always wanted to represent them and send them out. And my husband and I were both very skeptical about it because we wanted the children just to have normal lives. And uh, we resisted. And then one day she submitted our whole family for a commercial. And the next thing you know, we just start booking like this. And the checks start rolling in. And every experience that our children has had on this set has been wonderful, positive, And they nurture our children. And our children feel good that they're able to save money for their college education. And it's just been a wonderful experience you know they love to see themselves on TV and my two sons recently did a commercial with David Beckham and it's the new campaign where they have uh, David Beckham he's you know locked out of his house and, and is running through Beverly Hills in his underwear and my children are principals in that commercial they play soccer kids and and all I can say is that David and, and Victoria Beckham are just really lovely wonderful people really warm and friendly David was you know hugging my my boys in between the takes, and then Victoria asked us to give her our address. And two weeks later, we get a package in the mail from the Beckhams with his jersey, one for each son with their names on it, and a note from David. So, I mean, someone who's so busy as David, being a celebrity, you know, soccer player, actor, a very charitable person, to take the time, you know, to do that is incredible. I think most people look at images of their great-grandparents and their ancestors in photo albums. But I paint my ancestors, so I look at them on, on my walls, on my paintings, and they look back at me. You know, they talk to me. They tell me what's okay to paint, what's not okay to paint. This is the third 
painting I made where I take classical European paintings which were created during the slave trade era and I altered them to tell Afro-Caribbean slave stories. I just finished this one a few months ago and it's after Manet's Olympia but I call it Caroline and it's the story of my paternal great-grandmother Caroline and my great-grandfather William Bernard. So Caroline was the black maid servant of my great-grandfather William Bernard. He was a very wealthy uh, white man in Kingston. He was a stagecoach designer and he had a wife and children. And my grandmother being very poor and mulatto and barefoot would see her rich half-siblings frolicking in the mansion in their beautiful bows and dresses. With this painting, I, I wanted to show, of course, the, the resilience and the beauty of my Afro-Caribbean ancestors, but I also wanted to juxtapose that against the trauma, the violence, the suffering that they endured for the sake of memory. And you see that there's a brand on her uh, breast. I actually changed it to before slavery so that I could tell my dad that it's really not his grandmother because he gets upset that I would tell our family story and I understand that and so I imagine that this was how my grandmother Harriet was conceived we assumed of course that she was raped under this situation I curate out of necessity and out of obligation, one of my best accomplishments uh, was a show that I curated for the Department of Cultural Affairs called Colonialism, the Collective Unconscious. And there's a very well-known art critic named Matt Gleason uh, who writes for the Huffington Post and he ranked the show number five in the top uh, art shows of LA in 2011. And I very recently curated another show for the Department of Cultural Affairs in the city of Los Angeles and it was called Baila con Duende. It was at the Watts Towers Art Center. It ran for four months. And I think it was a pretty legendary show because there were 75 artists in them, in the show, and they were from all different levels in their career. There were some A-list, world-famous artists who sell their work for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, there were professors uh, mixed in with people who just began making art a few weeks ago. Even a child was in it, my son, an animator. And it was, the opening had like more than a thousand people. It was well-reviewed. And it was just beautiful to see famous artists come together in a show of solidarity with lesser known artists to show that, look, hey, this is what we got. And uh, so that show I'm really, I'm very pleased with the outcome of that show. is really, really, really unique and really special and really important um, because she's one of those few people that can uh, bring a lot of different kinds of people together. A lot of people who have diverse backgrounds, diverse levels of experience in the art world, many different kinds of personalities. She's really like a, a real person who can bring those people together and inspire people to action. And um, she believes in, I would say, some of those very fundamental pan-Africanist principles of unification, and, or I should say unity, and uh, power in numbers. And so, yes, yeah, she does, she's very driven. She's very ambitious, and that's one of the things that inspires me about her and inspires others. In addition to that, she makes amazing artwork. So the fact that she has this amazing artwork and she has this amazing commitment, that she's driven for herself and for her family, as well as these uh, Afrocentric principles, comes together in her in a unique way and puts her in a very central and important place now as, I think, a key person in the black arts community in Los Angeles, and not just for the black arts community, but for the arts communities in general. I like the blue. I'll put some of the blue back. Yeah. I inherited an activist spirit from my grandfather, Jose Rodriguez Figueroa, and I considered it an obligation to help lift as I climb myself, and I've got a long way to go. 
and I had a studio in Chinatown for five years, which was a public space. I kept it as a public sp space, and I called the effort Abla, Harvesting Asian Black Latino Artists, because I am Chinese, Black, and Cuban. And in that effort, I found that it was the Black artists who was the most underrepresented, the most marginalized. And so I came up with an acronym called BAILA, Black Artists in Los Angeles. And I started this effort where I would, I still do, I organize meetings with mainstream art organizations so that they can hear our voices. They're very well attended. And I invite all sorts of people, not just black people, white people, everybody who just loves um, the artwork of black people. And uh, I curate shows for black artists. And you know we get together and we're trying to publish. We're looking into performance, kind of a protested kind of performance, perhaps. And uh, just to help, you know, get us the representation that we need because we're generally not seen in the galleries. Those artists who, those black artists who are seen in the galleries, it's always the same five black famous artists. We're seldom reviewed in the paper. Um, there are very few black students in the art schools and, they're, and it's like we're almost non-existent in the faculty of art schools. So I just want to um, help change that because it's not representative of Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. For, for artists who are involved in black arts in LA, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. Baila has become quite a large with movement. Knowledge. There were 90 people at our last meeting, which was with the Hammer Museum. In those 90 people, I selected four of us that were kind of like a core group. We get together every two weeks and we're working on publishing a book, for example, about Baila con Duende and about talking how we might best structure the Baila con Duende meetings and other you know, activities that we could uh, create to help lift up our whole, um, our efforts. So. I agree. And I think it was very important that you mentioned that, or art, because we have people like J. Michael yeah, Walker, yeah, or yeah. white. Right. And <laughs> My kids have like the all-American life. They play every American sport that there is. They compete in baseball, soccer, basketball. Um, they take swimming lessons, karate, no, taekwondo, and I grew up the same, much the same way. I was a USGF gymnast, and I played Little League Baseball, which is a big American pastime, but there was no Little League Baseball in this part of Los Angeles, and I wanted my children to enjoy the same privilege that I did, and so I had to found, I had to create, and I had to incorporate and uh, start a franchise of Little League Baseball. It's an all-volunteer-run organization. My husband's been leading it since 2001. We've served over 600 um, families in this part of Los Angeles, and we've won a lot of championships. So it's uh, a very big part of our life, the City of Angels Little League. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to stand here and swing so hard that we turn our whole body around. We want to swing quick and fast, all right, so that we can repeat it as quick as possible. My mom's a very wonderful person. She, uh, she's she's interesting in every way. She's she has a lot of um, she has a lot of soul. She expresses it in her wonderful works of art. And um, she asks um, me and my brothers for help um, and advice for the paintings. And it just it's very um, it's very special to have a mom that can that is this. Um, Different than anyone else, and she's, I know um, she's loving as ever. So um, I, I um, love her a lot. So. <laughs> Outside of glorifying God, everything else I do is for my family. Absolutely everything. I'm a full-time graduate student for my children, so that they can look at me as a role model of excellence and determination and hard work do and they give us a cause and a purpose for everything we do. You know, they're our our joy, you know, our purpose. My message for women would be to love yourself and to realize that everything about you is beautiful. Your nappy hair is beautiful, your wide hips are beautiful, your stretch marks are beautiful. Everything about you is created in the image of God and to realize the resilience and the strength that you have as a person and the power that you have. 
and to just be able to look in the mirror and say, I am beautiful, you know. Thank you.